I know that you must die while you still can. The circle must come to a close, my love. You are not meant for this life. You must find that which was taken from you and travel beyond into the lands of the dead. I shall wait for you in death's halls, my love. love. Planescape Gate Torment is not an easy game to sell to people, especially not today. Baldur's Gate 3 has single-handedly risen the bar for immersive fantasy writing in the D&D canon. While Disco Elysium proved that CRPGs are more than capable to operate without a combat system. All because this team understood that their greatest strength was their writing. So it's hard not to view Planescape in comparison as incredibly crude. It's a 40 plus hour RPG with incredibly limited voice acting and has gameplay that clearly values its writing above all else, yet still makes the baffling choice to force its combat system on the player. Heck, I had never even heard of this game 5 years ago, and yet, finding it to be one of my favorite games of all time, and I felt so incredibly grateful for not letting my bias get the better of me here because I truly think there's a journey here that everyone should experience. So if you're someone who's wondering why this game has gained such a legendary status, or if you're on the fence by its ancient mechanics, my job today is to convince you why this game is still worth giving a chance, and why it might possibly be one of the greatest experiences you'll ever have with an RPG. I personally think that Planescape is a game best experienced as blind as possible, but obviously if you're watching this, you're in need of more convincing. So I'm going to avoid discussing the main story besides for one example, but I'll give a warning when it's coming. The examples that I'll have on screen however will come from multiple different points in this game and will be relevant to my talking points. If you read them, there's a chance that they will contain spoilers. You have been warned. And if you're wondering why I'm being this cautious about spoilers for a game released in 1999, it's because I think the most rewarding and memorable moments in this game come from your own intuition. This is a game that actively rewards curiosity. The players who will gain the most from this experience are the ones who stick around to explore every dialogue tree, and make mental notes of even the most subtle details that characters give you about this world. Now, before you run off in the opposite direction, I want to emphasize that I'm not this kind of person when it comes to RPGs. I often have a great impatience for extensive dialogue, especially if it doesn't pertain to the main story, voice acted or not. So the fact that Planescape can not only give me interest enough to talk to everyone I saw, but to actively get me to learn as much as I could about the planes is a testament to just how strong the world building and character writing truly is. Now given it helps that Black Isle didn't have to spend 10 years working from scratch like Zalem did as the entirety of Planescape had already been well established. It's based on a D&D campaign released all the way back in 1994, meaning Sigil, the planes, the factions that make up this world had already been well established. Heck, even some of the characters too. Funny enough, this is actually one of the aspects that kept me away from this game for so long. I had no prior background nor interest in tabletop roleplaying, but frankly, you don't need to understand any of it. The combat system is incredibly straightforward, and any role that a dungeon master may have filled here is replaced by scripted text and algorithms. In fact, I go as far as to say that Planescape Torment is less of a game and more of an interactive novel. There is a reason why people often joke that it's the best book that you'll ever play. And that's a major aspect that you need to consider before you pick up this game. Are you okay with the fact that the majority of your time is just going to be spent reading text? If you asked me that question 5 years ago, especially after finishing a heavily voice acted RPG like Persona 5, my answer would have been a resounding no. Heck, today I still think my answer would be no. But I think this mindset is a result of so many studios using voice acting to compensate for lackluster writing. May your heart be your guiding key. Yeah, the Pulitzer Prize is cute and sure everyone wants a New York Times bestseller, but no test may be more telling of a writer's ability than how well you can get a gamer to stop moving to read text on a screen. Yet Black Isle successfully designed a whole game around it. So how did they pull it off? By making Sigil one of the most vibrant locations you'll ever visit in a video game. 
This is a studio that had an incredible talent to make their characters feel alive, regardless of the context of their stories. The way they interact with the world felt and still is incredibly genuine. You tell me, is it more realistic for a person to hold a conversation with a stranger who walks into their house, or to actively ask them to get out, to come chasing after them with a weapon if they try to take anything sitting around? You'll go into a dungeon to finish a quest, only to realize you're completely under-equipped to handle it, and then you realize the guard won't let you out without a bribe. Yes, it's unforgiving, but the key takeaway here is that like real people, everyone is looking out for their own interests first. Well, at least if you're an American. Thanks, Black Isle. Not only does this make this world full of undead and floating skulls feel surprisingly grounded, but ironically, more fun to navigate. Since the world is so actively disinterested in you, it only makes it that much more satisfying when you do overcome the odds. I can't begin to tell you how thrilling it was that Opera barred his stupid 50 copper pieces only to pin his arm to the gate and threaten to break it unless he opened it. You can feel this interaction too if your dexterity isn't high enough. Better yet, you never actually see this option unless you're willing to take the risk to make him reach through the gate instead. And it's not your only option here either. If you're strong enough, you can just kill the guy and break it open yourself. Or maybe you'll just skim 10 coins off the top and call it a day. It's important to understand, however, that the game will always let you give him 50 copper pieces. The developers will never outright tell you about these other options. This is their way of teaching you that to survive in this world, you need to play to your strengths and get creative with your solutions. Remember this because you start in the hive, the most dangerous area in the entire city, where just walking into the wrong house or helping the wrong person can quite literally lead to you getting executed. And think about how bold of a choice that is from a design standpoint. They easily could have started you in the pompous clerk's ward and have you work your way down, which would have made a lot more sense from a design standpoint, right? Gradually introduce danger as the player becomes more accustomed to your mechanics. But they didn't. It really highlights just how much they wanted to convey how dangerous of a world this is to the player. Take for instance this poor woman who's losing her mind because she accidentally opened a portal on the sigil and now she has no way to get back home. For any normal person, this would be bad enough. But in this game, you play as an immortal being with absolutely no memory, no money, and if you're lucky, you'll probably leave out with a scalpel. My first death in this game didn't come from getting attacked by a thug on the streets, it was from me blatantly walking up to someone I didn't know and initiating a conversation. If I wasn't immortal, that would have been it. Just 10 steps out of the mortuary. It's a rude awakening to just how naive you truly are, and believe me, people are absolutely going to use that against you. Oh, but don't worry, because somehow it gets even worse. Because you have no memory and yet you have lived for so long, it seems like almost anyone in this city could have some sort of connection to you. I mean, no matter where you go in this world, anyone could say that you look familiar. You! What is it that brings you here? Have you come to see firsthand the misery you have wrought? Perhaps in death I still hold some shred of use for you, my love. Which is a blessing, by the way, because the most dangerous people you'll meet in this game are always the ones who know you and don't say a word. And do you see how that makes the game's biggest mystery of discovering who you are so fascinating? How many games can simultaneously make you the center of this world, yet make you feel so utterly powerless at the same time? At first, I was a little shocked that the game gave you such little freedom in your character design. Besides picking the class that you play, you have no choice in your appearance nor your gender. Your past and name have already been decided, and the nameless one even has a speaking voice actor. Uh, feels like I've been strained through someone's bowels. It was shocking to me that a game, celebrated as one of the greatest role-playing games of all time, started by taking so much freedom away from its players. Yet the true freedom in Planescape comes from shaping who this latest incarnation will become. You might find yourself starting as an outsider looking in, but slowly you'll begin projecting yourself onto him. 
as you shape the way that he interacts with others, who you choose to let follow you, and what kind of impact you want to leave on the planes. The further you begin to understand this world and its inhabitants, the more you shape him into a reflection of yourself. So when you start to learn about your other incarnations, how their beliefs and ideologies may differ from your own, it becomes a real moral dilemma. Do you hold yourself responsible for their actions? Should you be forgiven for actions you can't remember doing? More importantly, do you accept them as you? I think the choice to make your protagonist an immortal with memory loss was a genius move because of how deeply rooted you become in so many factions and areas of this world, that even the most mundane details can be clues into your past. It hits a point when the first moment you find something wrong in the world, you'll feel a chill run up your spine. But I often love how these mistakes can be a great learning experience here. They're often crucial moments that provide insight into your past motivations and desires, making every single one feel like a massive step forward. This is one reason why everyone will tell you that wisdom is your most important stat. Because with a high enough wisdom, certain phrases or reserve actions can trigger repressed memories. Some of them with incredible details not just about who you were, but even critical elements of lore and information on your companions too. The spontaneous nature of these interactions creates this fantastic feedback loop that keeps the player actively wanting to explore every dialogue option. It gives real weight and meaning behind the inquisitive nature of your character. And on that note, I also just love the fact that regardless of the situation, the Nameless One will always start a conversation by saying greetings. You see a reptilian creature with a snake-like body, four claw feet, leathery wings, and a draconian head. The scales covering its body are a vile shade of green. The creature stands upright on its high legs, balancing with its prehistle tail. As you approach, its eyes narrow the slits and it begins to hiss. I think that we can all agree that reading a document is always a lackluster moment in any game. Because regardless of how interesting the information is, in that moment, you are actively stripping control away from the player. What makes Black Isles approach to storytelling so effective is that all their writing is done through the medium of conversation. We are constantly being asked to engage in this world, lore is trickled in through a conversation at a bar, or philosophies are taught to us by helping individuals and factions. Take a moment to appreciate how even the smallest details in an idle conversation can often be crucial to opening up paths forward. But I want to emphasize how well though, Black Isle makes it feel like you're the one who's coming to those conclusions. Even if all these dialogue options have been written by someone in advance, there's something so satisfying about the hunt to find them. There's just an incredible amount of detail given to every character interaction. Take this drunken sensate in the clerk's work for instance. This woman serves no other purpose in this game but to throw insults at the player. Yet look at how many options we get if we try to interact with her. You could turn your back and simply ignore her. Or you could insult her instead and then when the conversation naturally devolves into hostilities, you can pick a fight or you can one-up her by calling the guards over instead. Better yet, if you start insulting her and turn your back halfway through, she'll tell you to get down and <sighs> tell you to lick her boot. And yes, for all you freaks out there, you can lick the boot. Or if you have a high enough dexterity, you can just pull her off her feet. Or my personal favorite, take a bite out of her leg. Hey, all I'm saying is that that will shut up just about anyone. The amount of variety and options you get, even in the smallest conversations, is absolutely astounding, where even just having the right item or companion with you can completely reshape the way interactions are carried out. This is why I consider Planescape to have the best companions in any game I have ever played. I never expected to go into it loving them either. Heck, in most games, I outright avoid them. But some of the most memorable moments you'll have in this game just comes from interacting with them in conversation. You can learn about their past, their ideologies, their future hopes and desires. And sure, plenty of games let you talk to your companions like this, but how many actually engage in conversation with other characters, providing their own input to key moments in the plot? No, I'm not saying after, but during it. Remember that woman we talked about earlier? If you have Mort in your party, you can just let him handle the situation instead. 
where he verbally insults her until she's just utterly speechless, only hilariously to get ambushed the moment he turns his back to Glow. And if you have Fault from Grace in your party, not only will she acknowledge the girl as a former student, but when she expresses her disappointment in her actions, it completely breaks down the hostilities between both parties. And then for Anna, you get the point. They feel like real people that have their own thoughts and beliefs. They'll interact with one another and get into banter. I estimate Fall from Grace to be found attractive by the male sex of over 321,423 separate species. Give or take five. Oh, does that include Modrons? I am no longer able to answer that question. I do not know. And I can't tell you how refreshing this is, when in 95% of all games, they feel like empty husks just meant to carry around your luggage, quietly just standing there to offer the same four lines of dialogue once combat arrives. One of the most moving experiences I had in this game didn't come from a story event, it just began with a small observation that my companion made about another member of our party, and me just having the insight to confront them on the matter. This is why I think Black Isle had a writing team a step above anyone in the industry. Because not only do revelations feel incredibly natural in the context of conversation, but as a player, you feel actively rewarded for your persistence. Not only am I more likely to keep interacting with my companions as the game proceeds, but I have a better understanding of the importance of context as well. It isn't a matter of simply making the player experiment, but to make them think. You have to get them to understand how these characters interact. Don't spoon feed them the answers. A great mystery, regardless of the medium, makes you feel like a detective. That may sound obvious, but you'd be surprised how many games just don't do this. They place down markers to tell you where to go or give you a set list of items and set roadblocks to make sure you don't miss key details. LA Noir, for instance, uses sound cues to provide hints to the players at crime scenes. And at first, this feels like a very clever way of providing immersive feedback, until you realize that every clue is met with a small chime and vibration of the controller. And I do mean every single one. If that wasn't enough hand-holding for you, the music won't fade until every single clue is found in an area. It's great that players are given the option to turn these features off, but then you realize how utterly helpless you are. If I'm not going to be able to come back here, how can I tell if I have everything that I need? Better yet, how do I even tell what I can interact with? It devolves into you endlessly mashing A on every object that you see, because frankly, the game was never meant to be played like this. Unless the developer is actively holding your hand, you cannot engage in the world in the way that it was attended. This entire illusion of deduction just crumbles. When a developer takes no risk in their design, the unattended consequence is that for you as a player, feel that your intelligence is being insulted. Not everything here is going to be relevant. Let's go back to that ship for a moment. This is a flashback taken from the game The Return of the Oberden. The entirety of this game is centered around a basic idea. Figure out who these crew members are, and how they die through shots of the past. Be it through a handful of documents that were given, or details we hear or observe in these memories. It's clear in this flashback that we're meant to follow the path of the bullet to figure out who exactly shot the hanged man. But that's only one piece of the puzzle. Since we don't know the name of any of these men and no other hints are given here, we have no choice but to keep pushing forward to use details from other memories to slowly put this picture together. And of course, you can come back here at any time you want. It genuinely feels like a massive jigsaw puzzle. And if you've ever tried solving one yourself, you'll understand how addicting that can be. Yes, yes there is only one solution to these problems, but there's power in that simplicity. Because there's nothing more satisfying than solving an issue using only our sense of observation and deduction. You know, like a detective? When there are no set orders, no roadblocks, or a need for hand-holding, we feel empowered. All because in this case, Lucas Pope understood the enjoyment that comes from player freedom. Note how everything in Planescape can be actively solved just using two simple methods. When you find an item, examine it. 
When you see someone with a distinct name, talk to them. That's it. It's so blatantly simple, but it's because of that simplicity that the developers are able to take a hands-off approach. There are no quest markers, no overbearing hints, and suddenly this world feels alive and vibrant. Because you're in a sandbox that you're absolutely free to explore. Yes, these areas are small, but they offer a degree of freedom that a game like this just can't afford. I put around 50 hours into my first playthrough of this game, and I want to say at least half of that was just spent in 6 locations, because the amount of detail and interaction here is simply astonishing. I love Planescape Torment for a very similar reason that I love Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, because every building and location in this world serves a purpose. Now that significance can vary greatly depending on the quest, but nothing here is just to fill space. It's all connected to your experience in some meaningful way. This isn't something exclusive to just Planescape. This is at the heart of all Black Isle's best design games. The reason I consider Fallout 2 to be my favorite in the franchise is because Black Isle gave players this same kind of freedom. Your goal may be highlighted from the start. Pay attention. Find the Holy Vault 13 and bring back the Gak. But there are no quest markers nor even a single hint of where Vault 13 may be. All you're given is a single lead, which begins your breadcrumb trail. And because you're so helplessly alienated and lost in this hostile wasteland, you have no choice but to talk to everyone in these towns, to take any quest that might just get you a little bit closer to figuring out your goal. Apparently Vault City used a gag to make their city, maybe they'll still have one now. Great, my lead went missing. But someone did mention he trades in the den. I guess I should check out there next. The Gek is always in the same location no matter what playthrough of Fallout 2 you're on. Every hint, every detail, is meticulously designed by someone else in advance. But that doesn't mean you have to put a giant X on the screen telling them where to go. As budgets continue to skyrocket for games, we need to remember that complexity and scale don't necessarily lead to a better final product. Instead, we should be crafting environments where players can develop their own theories and conclusions. And it's for this reason that I need you to resist the temptation to play this game with a guide. Impatience is your enemy, and I can't tell you how many times I will let my paranoia get the better of me and look up at items sitting in my inventory, only to spoil future events for myself because I got impatient and didn't trust the direction of the team. The most impressive aspect of this game is how it actively rewards experimentation. When you have an idea, more likely than not, there's going to be a dialogue option that lets you act on it. So don't be afraid to revisit old areas or even hold on to items if you think they still have value, because more likely than not, they do. The Nameless One also keeps a journal of any key details you come across in the world, which even has a search function now thanks to the Enhanced Edition. So don't be too worried about missing some details in conversations or needing to write things down. The key is to have a general understanding of your conversation once it finishes. I found that as long as I took the time to actively explore and talk to everyone I could, I just wasn't missing anything important in this game. Besides one very crucial item that we're going to discuss right now. And this is your warning to skip to this time marker here if you don't want it spoiled. Though to be honest, I think I'm doing you a huge justice here. <sighs> All right, let's get this out of the way. Let's talk about the dodecahedron. You see this giant gumball? This is crucial to moving forward with the plot, and it's at the center of one of the most annoying moments in this entire game. Something crucial to know is that items can only be examined if they're in the Nameless One's inventory. Not on the ground, not even in your companion's inventory. The issue that I have with the dodecahedron is that nothing about it intrigues you. Nothing about its design makes you want to interact with it. In fact, when I first saw it sitting in a cabinet surrounded by potions and charms, I immediately concluded that it must be a sellable item or some sort of charm. Maybe some random item to open up a portal? So I just dropped it in my companion's inventory, where even the description never really gives you a good hint that you should interact with it. Compare it with the Modron Cube, for instance. It looks like a miniature figure, right? 
it's clearly not a healing item, equipable armor, or even a weapon. So naturally your first instinct is to interact with it. A white multi-sided geometric shape does not. I'd be more forgiving if the game had pushed your mindset to actively look for an item like it, but it seems like every hint points towards a wizard named Quell, who provides some great hints of the key needed to open up this portal, but at no point does this game ever hint at where this said portal is. This is the only reason why you need this stupid shape. You just have to be lucky enough to find it locked in your old room in the fest hall, hopefully examine it, successfully open it, and somehow realize that you could take it to the linguist in the bottom corner of the map to translate it, find his notebook, then read his father's translation, only multiple pages later to see a mention of a legacy you left behind, and hopefully still remember at this point that there's a character who holds legacies for people. Go there to get said legacy, and conclude that the receipt here can be turned into the foundry, which finally lets you open up a portal that you had commissioned. In my opinion, this should have been swapped for the optional quest to finish the Dream Maker instead. Not only is there a character in the foundry that directly tells you what you need to finish the machine, but literally right next to Quell is a sensory stone that will give you every hint that you need to find each missing part. It even directly leads to optional areas in this game that you may have missed, and would have given meaning to this seemingly pointless side quest. Okay, I'm done ranting. But since we're already focusing on the negative aspects of Planescape, let's begin discussing other aspects of this game that turn people off. I'll give some advice too on how I got around them as well. I'm a huge fan of Planescape's art style and general presentation, especially how all the UI seems to center around gears and machinery, but I often found the world to be incredibly confusing to navigate. I can't tell you the amount of times I would hit a dead end in this game, only to realize that there was a hidden entrance off screen, or a sector of the map that I just hadn't explored yet. The solution for any player is to open up their map to look for pins indicating buildings, but most buildings are purposely left off until you fill it in on the map. So I recommend turning on Show Walkable Path whenever you can. And I understand that the black fog is supposed to serve as an indication of unexplored territory, but when it also serves as the boundary line, it's often hard to tell where the map ends and what can still be explored. It's something I wish they did more to address with the Enhanced Edition. Okay, let's quit beating around the bush. Let's finally address the elephant in the room. The thing that you've all been waiting for. Cross saving. The first thing that you do when you open up this game is that you open up the menu and turn this on. Seriously, in 2017, who thinks having an in-game option for cross-saving was a smart idea? And to have it turn off by default, no less. Speaking of saving, do it a lot, because there are areas in this game that you won't be able to go back to, and leaving say a companion or a key there means losing it for good. Oh yeah, and I guess there's the combat too. How many times must this fool die? There's something incredibly ironic that in a game that you spend 40 plus hours just reading, the biggest point of deviation for players would be the combat, surprising considering how little it actually makes of the core experience. But I have to agree, because Planescape's lowest moments are typically directly tied into its combat. The system in of itself is actually fairly simple. You have this button here that allows you to move all your companions at once, your spells and abilities are neatly laid out on a toolbar for you, and you can even pause the game with a spacebar to plan out your actions. You have the standard weapons, healing items, and armor, and then there's the scrolls for learning spells if you're a mage build. But that's really all there is to it. It's an incredibly basic combat system. And I do think there is a real opportunity here to create depth with this system. It's just disappointing that most fights devolve into pressing pause, clicking on an enemy, and then sending your whole party to attack them. While the Hive is such a wonderful starting location, was it really necessary to put this many thugs constantly respawning in every single location? It just makes the game incredibly stressful at points too, when your options for reviving companions are so incredibly limited in the beginning. Though, if we're being honest, if one of your companions goes down, you're just gonna go back to your last save instead. It's a blessing that this game allows you to save so often, but as a result, any risk is seemingly not existent. Even when later fights required a certain amount of strategy to defeat, I always found it so frustrating how limited your movement options were. 
There is no option to separate your parties into groups, so you either move them all at once or individually. And the movement in of itself is incredibly frustrating. Regardless of where you click, it often feels like characters will never move in a straight line to that point. Their actions feel incredibly sporadic and random. And keep this in mind if you choose to play a mage build, because there's a certain level of distance that is critical to casting spells, and it really turns strafing into a nightmare in the late game. I think what makes the late game in particular so controversial without going into spoilers of course, is that while 80% of this game requires very little knowledge or need of combat, to force players for that last 20% to fight some of the hardest enemies in the game just feels like a massive betrayal. For me personally, this didn't really take away from my experience with Planescape because so many of these fights can just be bypassed with Mord's Litany of Curses, but at that point, why even have them to begin with? I can't help but wonder how much the last third of this game would have benefited from that additional time and resources. But maybe it was just a result of that era. After all, Planescape wasn't a kickstarted project backed by a group of passionate fans, it was a product made by an established studio. One that had to justify to his publisher that their games could make a profit. A publisher whose financial situation, mind you, was only getting worse every single year and would lead to Black Isle's closure only four years later. It may not surprise you to find out that Planescape Torment was never a commercial success. Brian Fargo, the founder of Interplay Entertainment, estimated that the game only sold 400,000 units in its initial lifespan and yet its impact is still being felt to this very day. Many of the individuals who worked on this game, such as Chris Avalone, will go on to work on some of the greatest games ever created. It's commonly cited as a source for inspiration for many Western RPG creators. Heck, you can't even go two sentences on Disco Elysium's Wikipedia page without seeing this game mentioned. When we look back and think of influential games, it always seems to be in terms of gameplay. Very rarely is it in terms of art direction or writing. It's always about how Alone in the Dark opened the doors for survival horror, or how Grand Theft Auto 3 paved the way for open world sandboxes. But could you look back at these games today and still say they shine as bright as the games that they inspired? With Planescape, you could. It's not a foundation, it's a benchmark. A testament to how great writing and atmosphere are utterly timeless. Planescape Torment is not an easy game to sell to people, especially not today. No one is going to try to design a narrative RPG like this anymore. But the fact that so many modern developers list it as a favorite, that we're still writing and talking about it over 25 years later, it really shows the lasting impact that this game has on so many people who play it. Will it be the same way for you? Well, there's only one way to truly figure that out. But what I can say is this. In this story of an immortal man trying to discover who he is, many have unexpectedly found themselves instead. What can change the nature of a man? This is a story that will break you, one that will touch you, one that might vividly horrify you, but it also holds some of the funniest moments that I have ever experienced in a video game. It's more than just a game, honestly. It's a journey. One that has a little bit of everything, and yet somehow is nearly flawless in execution. And I think that's why today we call it a masterpiece. Thanks for watching.